I will be trying to, to illustrate uh, with, my, with my presentation is uh, a way in which basic and applied science are kind of converging here at Eacher. If you look at our work site, this is the overview from a drone. Um, it's about a kilometer long and about 400 meters wide. We are trying to build the first um, industrial scale fusion power device. And uh, if you look at all the, the nuclear devices that generate energy today, they're all fission. Um, fusion is different. I'll, I'll explain the physics a little bit and then go on to, to show um, sort of how that, how that actually works. But I also will try to illustrate the degree to which international collaboration is a part. There's never been a project like this. So why do I say that? This, this um, uh, switch yard, for example, was largely built with parts manufactured and shipped from the US. It's a steady state shipyard. Here you have parts in a pulse power shipyard that are largely from China. Here, where our magnet conversion buildings are, you have, you have parts from India, China, Russia, and, uh, and uh, Republic of Korea. This is mostly a cryogenics plant built in part in, uh, in, uh, from components made by France, some by India. Um, and that is simply a microcosm of how, of how this plant is put together. The components are made on three continents and shipped like a giant Lego that is supposed to somehow fit with the, with the desired precision. This building, for example, the, the gray building at, at center left is the only building owned by India because India is building this gigantic vessel, this cryostat that houses everything in a light vacuum in a cool environment. And because it's 30 meters high and 30 meters wide, it could not possibly be shipped. So from these magnificent forging facilities in Hazira, India shipped precision parts, about 56 parts here. And then an Indian team supervising a group of German welders under French nuclear regulation and using an, a, a form of stainless steel developed elsewhere in Europe, um, put this piece together that would house everything to make this, this fusion device. So that sounds like a lot like applied science, and it is, but it is also basic science. And I'll try to, uh, to illustrate a bit what I mean by that. So when you see these flags that fly on our, on our uh, work site, you know, seeing China flying next to Europe or seeing um, uh, Russia flying next to the US, where else would you see that? Maybe at the, United, at the United Nations or maybe at the FIFA World Cup. But for all of these countries to actually be contributing parts, when in the news, what you will nor normally see is trade wars or disagreements or even armed conflict in this or that region, this is really um, a 40-year commitment because of a common goal. And what Dr. Cabell was talking about, and actually, Christina, what you asked about with science diplomacy, um, this is actually very much um, a common goal that we can transform our energy legacy, not only for, say, um, the Sustainable Development Goal 7 on clean energy, but also um, sustain, you know, addressing climate change, addressing inequality, et cetera. So the science. Fusion in the universe, this is the reason that we all exist. Fusion is the reason for light and heat and, and life itself on Earth. At the center of our sun, um, we think of it as a large ball of hydrogen, which it is, and, it, and gas, which it is. But with the sun being 300,000 times the density of Earth, at the center of the sun, you really have uh, hydrogen at about 70 times the density of steel. So proton-proton fusion occurs by crush, gravitational crush. The, the particles are forced together. To try to reproduce that, we've, we've kind of figured that out, that this was fusion about 100 years ago roughly 1920, but figuring out how we could possibly harness this on Earth seemed impossible because we cannot reproduce this gravitational force. So there are several ways that are brought about that we try to make this happen, fusion on Earth. The one that we're trying to do here is probably the most advanced, arguably, some would dispute that. It's certainly uh, among the most uh, commonly tried. We call it magnetic confinement fusion. So in this in this device, which is called a tokamak, which is a toroidal shape or a donut shape, um, you have a magnetic field. So it's toroidal shape magnetic field and a Russian acronym that, that, that came up with tokamak. 
what that means is that this metal cage has an invisible magnetic cage that conforms almost precisely to the shape. And within that, we put a tiny bit of gas, um, two forms of hydrogen, deuterium with an extra neutron and tritium with two extra neutrons. And we, we inject heating systems until we get this to 150 million degrees, 10 times hotter approximately than the core of the sun, which is the speed at which these particles, when there's an electric current here that has ionized them, so you've got all charged particles or mostly charged particles, these gaseous uh, nuclei will overcome their positive attraction and hit and fuse and, 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 and join together. And in that, a tiny bit of the mass will be given off as energy so that the charge, the, the mega electron volts of the particles that leave, you see the helium nucleus here is five times larger, uh, five times more energetic than the incoming particles, which will allow the helium nucleus to continue to heat the plasma until we get to a point of a burning or largely self-heating plasma. The neutron is the exception. It's, of course, not a charged particle, so it will escape the magnetic field, transfer its kinetic energy to the wall of the, of the tokamak, to the steel, and heat the water that circulates behind it. In a commercial, in a commercial plant, um, this would be expected to produce electricity, although ITER uh, will not produce electricity. We are trying to observe a phenomenon that's never been preserved on Earth. This is the basic science. The only time, I mean, we can't observe the center of the sun too directly, obviously. And on Earth, the only time we've had a burning plasma is really in an H-bomb. Right, So to be able to observe a controlled burning plasma for pulses of about six and a half minutes, that's the ether design, that would be unprecedented. So there is plasma physics basic phenomena, and there is where the basic science uh, will, be, will be coming at ether. Now, why? Yes, it's for applied reasons, because if we can harness this, we have baseload power, carbon-free, with an abundant supply of deuterium and then tritium, which is very scarce in nature, we would breed by placing lithium in the walls of the reactor so that the tritium, uh, the neutron hitting the wall could also be breeding more tritium fuel. So that's why we say abundant fuel supply. And as long as we choose the right materials for the walls, there's no long lived radioactive waste products and it's extremely safe. You do not, unlike fission, where you have, say, a couple of hundred tons of uranium or plutonium as your, as your fuel in the reactor, here you have two to three grams of hydrogen, no radioactive uh, uh, product in the helium, and what you have essentially is the neutron radiation, and then the walls, of course, will get activated. And if you choose your materials wisely, we should not have any uh, long-lived high radioactive waste. In addition, it's not a chain reaction, so it's very difficult to do. But if it works and you have a problem, it shuts down instantly. There is no possibility in this physics of a Chernobyl or, or Fukushima, et cetera. So I've pretty much covered how it works. You, you inject the gas, you run a current to make it an ionized gas or a plasma, and then you use multiple heating systems. So the challenge is containing it. So. Um, what you, the way that you contain it, you have a central magnet here, largely made in this case in San Diego. You have D-shaped magnets that go here around the outside. Those are mostly made uh, half in Italy, half in Japan. You have circular magnets that are difficult to see here because this is a cutaway, but you can see this one at the top. This was made in St. Petersburg in Russia. It just arrived in, on our worksite in the middle of February. The others were either too large to be made uh, and shipped, so they were made here on the site or the one at the very bottom was made in China and, and um, shipped here, it's already installed. So the idea was born in 1985 when Reagan and Gorbachev were trying to reduce their weapons arsenals and they ended up with the plan to make something positive as well, to make ITER. Japan and India, uh, sorry, Japan and Europe joined quite quickly and the design discussions went on through the 90s. Then in the 2000s, uh, China and Korea and India joined, and the agreement was signed in 2006. 
Now we get questions. We've had questions from Jordan, from United Arab Emirates, from others about the possibility of others joining. And the answer is this is open to anyone, to any country that can show that it's got the political will and some financial contribution and also the, the scientific uh, capabilities. But the idea of 1985 was very explicitly written for the benefit of all humankind. So all the members wanted to be the host because they thought their, their companies would benefit from, from building this. And so the agreement was that Europe would contribute 45% and the other non-European members contribute 9%, but not as cash. Most of it, 80 to 90% would be contributed as components. And that's where we got to this rather strange procurement of the components, the more than a million components that go into the tokamak itself, plus all of the different components that go around the outside. So as I said, here you see the human scale of the human at the bottom of this figure. You have a giant central solenoid made in six modules in, in uh, the US, and then the various contributions from uh, Japan and, and Italy, uh, Europe for the, for the D-shaped toroidal field coils, and the, the manufacture of the circular magnets in China and Russia and, um, and Europe. And if you go to the overall cryostat, really there are more than a million components in here. So this is an extraordinarily oversimplified breakdown. But the key is that all of the intellectual property coming out of this is shared with all members. So whether it goes on for more basic science or more applied science, it's really a shared device. So I'll give you just a few photographs and then talk about the global industry. The photographs just show you what it's like to assemble this machine, a 30 meter diameter first piece that gets lifted by these overhead cranes, taken and dropped into this pit so that when it is put in the pit, there's the top down view. And you can see there the welding lines of what I was describing earlier, the German engineers welding under Indian supervision and French, French uh, nuclear safety regulation, but still getting to an extremely high tolerance. This was the second piece, which goes on top and gets welded around just to create the general case that everything would fit into. Here you have the, the Chinese made uh, magnet, uh, the first magnet weighing about 400 tons. So you're talking more than a fully loaded 747 jetliner there. And that's true of most of these big magnets. The, the next one, um, a little larger in size, a little bit lighter in weight, made here on site. And then here what you have is a 40 degree segment of the 360 degree tokamak, the vacuum vessel. So you mount on this magnet, uh, sorry, on this vacuum vessel sector, which was made in Korea, two Japanese made D-shaped magnets. And then in between, I'll show you in a later photo, a thermal shield that goes in between. Almost all of this is first of a kind components. Here you can see uh, after it's lowered into the pit, what this looks like. So here we were doing most of this through COVID, the assembly photos you've seen, making progress at a slower rate, understanding the challenges. And now we've recently come across some leaks that are in this, in these thermal shields where the, the uh, gaseous uh, helium circulates to keep the barrier between the interior, 150 million degrees, and these superconductor magnets, which have to be cooled to almost absolute zero, minus 269 degrees uh, Celsius or four degrees Kelvin. So right now we're taking a step backward to work on some of the repairs and we'll get back on track. Meanwhile, around the facility, we see the, the cooling water system, uh, quite a normal cooling water system, just a very, very high uh, degree of capacity, able to remove 1.2 gigawatts of heat. Now in its pre-commissioning, here are some other examples where you have uh, Korean transformers, Chinese transformers, which have come from different parts of the world and they actually look different one to the other, but they have exactly the same technical specifications. If you go around the world, you might have heard about fusion of a different kind where lasers were shot at a tiny, tiny plasma uh, pellet in the US. This is inertial confinement, also making progress. Here in Germany, you have what's called a stellarator, which is like a tokamak, but more twisted, uh, much smaller than ether, but also making progress. And recently, especially in the last five years, a lot of private sector people coming up with their own 
uh, with their own projects, some of them drawing off of each other, and certainly all of us working together toward a common goal. And then if you look at what we've done with superconductors, it has created advances in being able to map the human brain or in a more applied way, enhanced electric train bodies based on some of the work that we did on complex aluminum structures. Our diagnostics, which are many of them unprecedented, are, are helping with geothermal energy, laser welding, cancer treatment, et cetera, and, and there's more, many, many more um, spin-offs. So I will stop there. That is my overall presentation. Here we have Photoshopped ITER into the Milky Way because really ITER is more or less making a small sun on Earth. And um, so that brings my, my presentation to a close. Thank you, Levan. A very good presentation. Um, I think you have not commented on that, but um, um, do you think is steel fu fusion on time to help us uh, with climate change? Um, yes and no. I think if you look at how long it takes to roll out a new energy technology, the solar installations and wind installations that we're seeing now were really pioneered in the probably 1980s when you were starting to see the very first not not full scale solar plants. So rolling out a technology like fusion and having our goals of countries trying to get to net zero by 2050 or earlier, there is one way that you could look at it and say no. But I will be completely honest. I'm a bit of a cynic for two reasons. Um, one is that for us to really be sustainably developing, we have to think about countries that are um, still very, very short on electricity, the lifestyles that they want to build. So we're actually going to see energy, uh, probably even though we're trying to make it more green, we're gonna see more doubling, some project tripling of energy use by the end of the century. So the only way we're going to be able to do that is if we harness solar and wind and renewables for where they are most well suited, but also new technologies like fusion that will help us to be green for the longer term. So different scientists will give you different timelines for when they want to bring fusion on the grid. But even if we had a perfect fusion plant today, to scale that up to replace fossil fuels means we need to have large scale use of clean concrete or steel production, other, other kinds of technologies. And so to get the generations of plants that will really roll out I think it will take longer by the time we have enough plants, longer than 2050. But I also personally do not believe we're going to avoid the 1.5 or 2 degrees of warming. I think we will have most likely some irreversible damage from climate change, which means actually with sea level rise and more impact, we will need more energy. So I think the answer is yes and no, depending on how you view that question. I see. So I've seen also in your presentation that is a collaborative effort. So ITER is definitely a collaborative effort. And I see also on your answer that if we want to do actually something towards climate change, we also have to use all we have. So even fusion would not be sufficient, we, we should use all our tools. And I don't know if, um, um, just a comment, um, just before we had a section with interview with scientists and I asked uh, almost all of them, uh, what scientific breakthrough would they like to see in the coming years? So like to be a little bit creative. And uh, we received a lot of answers in the direction of energy conversion, energy storage. All of these uh, were more or less unit, uh, unitary yeah. um, yeah. in this direction. And um, just one last comment, because now we have a little bit, uh, one, two minutes left. Um, just today at lunchtime, I heard of a startup on fusion. Um, would this private sector endanger the future of ITER? Or on the other way, we are talking about collaboration, would be something that we all could profit from? Yeah, the answer again is, is ambivalent a little bit. Um, certainly they will not make ITER obsolete at all because we're like a, a giant national lab. We're just a national lab for 35 countries all, all working together and hopefully you know, Kazakhstan has joined as an associate member, so has uh, Australia, Canada is working on it. We've talked to Iran, um, that was part of the Iran nuclear deal, which is kind of now in suspense. But the truth is that um, this will be a, a, a lab, a global laboratory where people can really study. And the other private sector initiatives, quite rightly, are viewed toward commercial deployment. deployment. So they are not trying to invite 
you know, all the scientists to come and study. They're making machines that in some cases will destroy themselves, but with a really, really good set of data coming out of that, that's planned. So the private sector, when I talk to them, say ITER inspired us. This is, if you look 15 years ago, there were maybe one or two private sector facilities. Now that ITER has shown this growth over the last seven or eight years, it's hard to keep up. Literally, we have something like 35 private sector initiatives with roughly 5 billion US dollars put in over the last, say, two, three years. So that, that is exploding. And that says that even some of them will fail, no question. But that says that we're getting closer to making this a reality. Mm -hmm. And um, you see, I asked Gihan before about uh, her impression on who should be driving science diplomacy. Uh, can we also have your opinion on this? Um, to be honest, you know, the, the science diplomacy has to come from, from three sectors. It has to come from universities because there and teachers, even at the even at the grade school level, because this is what inspires the generations that are going to make a better future. So we need that inspiration. That that is where science diplomacy starts in kindergarten. In, it's a way to help us view each other as a globally connected family. And then it is the researchers, the actual, the ones at, at ITER and so forth, who yes, are the scientists and so forth that need to get out. And and you will find in the origins of ITER way back in the 50s, the, there was a soldier who wanted to be, he really wanted to be a, phys, a, a physicist, but he got conscripted by the Soviet Union into World War II. And it was only after the war when he had no education and just a stack of physics books that he was stationed by himself and he came up with this idea of a tokamak that led to ITER. And about nine years later, the Soviet Union did one of the most absurd things in the history of civilization. They went to the UK to make a presentation of largely classified material to just say, let's share what we have. And of course, the Americans and the British were totally suspicious and said, they must be fooling us. But the scientists on the margins of the global Atoms for Peace conferences were the ones who shared data and said, actually, yes, this has merit. And that's why fusion has been, I think, quite unique, where the scientists and the politicians and the teachers all need to show, all need to advance science diplomacy. Mm 